The Legend of Zelda is a series of games that for generations have captured the hearts of millions. With its amazing worlds, characters, gameplay, music, etc, etc. You know who Zelda is, you know about Ganon and Link. You know the Master Sword and all of the great games like Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask. Breath of the Wild and Spirit Trap. Well, I guess that last one is more of a me thing. But you know all these amazing titles that have been ingrained into pop culture. But over the years, there have been some that are still fondly remembered, but may have not had the same impact as well as other titles. Oh, um, uh, maybe another time, Spirit Tracks. For now, in honor of Tears of the Kingdom coming in the next few months, how about we discuss a trilogy of games? A trilogy of games that have always piqued my interest for how they took the classic formula and built a multiplayer experience around it. Well, I say trilogy, but it's really more of a quadrilogy of games? Maybe a saga? Yeah, a saga. A saga of four games that surround the story of a blade known as the Four Swords. Well, except for the last one, but it's still kind of in there. You'll see what I mean later. But continuing on from what I was saying, I can't think of a better place to start than with the miniature adventure that was larger than life. Minish Cap. Wait, Minish Cap isn't a multiplayer game, I'm sure some of you are saying, and that's true. But it is the origin story of the blade we know as the Four Sword. Minish Cap was a title that was developed and released on the Game Boy Advance by the same team that developed the two Oracle games on the Game Boy. After completing those two adventures, they started work on an unannounced Zelda title only for it to be shelved so that the team could work on Four Swords. However, in 2003, Shigeru Miyamoto and Eiji Aonuma revealed that the shelved game had become a prequel to Four Swords, known as the Minish Cap. It's kind of funny how all that works out, you know? I always thought that the Minish Cap came out first, but no, Four Swords came out packaged alongside a GBA version of A Link to the Past a year before. And then we had Four Swords Adventures come out a few months before Minish Cap. That's just weird, right? Anyway, the idea of Minish Cap came from Hidemaro Fujibayashi, the director of the game, who was thinking about the symmetries that define Zelda. Specifically, what if instead of light and dark, we did big and small? He has also stated that he wanted to do things in a 2D Zelda that were more geared towards 3D as a way to impress the player, which we can see in a few of the set pieces in Minish Cap. They wanted to make a 2D Game Boy Advance game that can compete with a 3D Zelda. As Fujibayashi puts it, they were trying to make something that would be called the pinnacle of 2D gaming. Or maybe he was just saying all this because the interview was more of a promotion for the game. There's always a sprinkle of fact in every teaspoon of fiction, and I do genuinely think that his goal was to make a big thing in such a small package. Yes, I will be making those types of dumbass jokes the whole time, how could I not? Minish Cap is your usual 2D Zelda with the dungeons, combat, and items you're familiar with alongside its own creative takes to help it stand out. It's a really wonderful adventure, and if you're looking for a good place to start the series, right here might just be it. Though, be sure to ask Link's grandpa what to do when you get lost, as the bird on your head ain't saying much in that regard, but we'll get to him later. Minish Cap is one of those games that for 95% of it, I think you won't have much issue finding where to go. But there is a moment or two that'll trip you up, so maybe it wouldn't hurt to talk to Gramps if you're having trouble. You may think that this game would be impossible to get lost in, because when you open up the map, Hyrule looks a lot smaller than usual. Hell, two of the main MacGuffins are gotten in the first two hours. But don't be fooled, my friend, as each of these rectangle spots has tons of depth to them, as there is either a lot of characters to talk and interact with, or maybe hidden spots that need items like bombs or the mole mitts. And maybe, just maybe, if you look with a keen eye, you'll find places that seem too small to do anything with. But with the power of the old man on your head, Link is able to shrink and explore the world at the size of a gnat. Exploring places that would be too hard to get into otherwise, or places that the rest of the population just had no idea were there. Like a secret dungeon inside of a fountain, a temple hidden inside a piece of ice, or a magical world full of its own people. And facing dangers that were once easy to deal with, but at a reduced size are now extremely dangerous. Like puddles, which are now like oceans, raindrops, which hit like a boulder, 
potholes, which are now like a deep chasm, or the usual basic enemies becoming boss encounters for somebody who's so small. The dungeons in this game are wonderful. Like usual, they have their own gimmicks or themes with Link having to find a specific item that allows him to complete the dungeon, and the puzzles are all so satisfying and fun to complete. The combat feels as good as most other 2D Zeldas, but I think this one may be my favorite due to the cool abilities you gain through the Tiger Scrolls. Fighting stuff like Dark Nuts at first is quite the pain, but once you get your full arsenal and some new sword techniques, you'll go through them like a hot knife through butter, and it's satisfying. I do have one problem with the combat though. If you're not careful, you will get comboed a lot in this game. And it can get aggravating, especially when you get caught on fire and Link just runs around at light speed. And now you have barely any control over him. It didn't happen a lot, but man, it did get old. Otherwise though, I really enjoyed the gameplay and puzzles. A new gameplay element in this game is the Kinstones. You're able to collect and fuse kinstones with 90% of the NPCs, which give you all sorts of different rewards. Such as chests with rare items, golden enemies that drop a boatload of rupees. A butterfly that increases swim speed? Yeah, some of these are more side quest related, and kinstones are usually the solution to most side quests in the game. The best reward from these comes in the magic boomerang you get from Tingle and his brothers, which you can control after throwing it, which is really cool, Though it kind of makes me regret buying the normal one earlier. But then again, the magic one is a late game thing, and I'd rather pay for a boomerang than wait the whole game for one. These things are always broken in 2D Zelda. You can also get charms from the Oracle Sisters, which give you a stat boost depending on the sister. Though, you can only get two out of the three, which I'm not sure if this is a meta joke about the cancelled third Oracle game, or maybe they ran out of time again and just had to cut the third one out. Either way, it kind of bums me out having to doom one of these girls to being poor and homeless. Sorry, Nehru, you're just my least favorite. Furore is green and has the best charm, and Din is just... <laughs> Din, so let's not kid ourselves there. Anyway, the last of the new mechanics is the power of the Four Sword, which can split Link into multiple copies. It's a really cool concept, but it's very underused in the game. I know this game was made to be strictly single player, so you didn't want it to feel like a lesser Four Swords, but I don't know, I wish we could have had more utility for this blade. Other than pushing away heavy rocks or striking a few different things at once, this is more of a nitpick since the story of this game is the creation of the sword. So it makes sense it's not at its full strength yet, only being able to make mirror-like copies of Link instead of the four different sentient versions. I just wish we had a little bit more to do with the blade, you know? You only use the Four Swords gimmick in one boss fight, and it's the last one. Again, mostly nitpicking, but it's just weird how the sword doesn't work the same as it did in the last two games. Like, even when it's complete, it does... <sighs> Alright, enough nitpicks. The graphics in this game are great. They really use the power of the GBA to do lots of cool visuals that would have been impossible on the Game Boy. And it really does feel like a 3D Zelda at times, which is what they were going for. The actual look of this game is great, it's just so vibrant and colorful. And it was a fantastic decision to go for the Wind Waker art style for these three games. The cartoony look fits well with the wild character and monster designs in the game, and I'm surprised at how well the N64 and Game Boy characters blend into the new art style, while looking exactly how they did on those consoles. The music in this game is great too, it always surprises me how the guys at Nintendo did such amazing soundtracks on the system with the... Um interesting sound chip. The main Nintendo teams were always able to deliver a good soundtrack and even sound effects. Though the Wind Waker screen doesn't really fit the a Link to the Past Link, it just... I don't know who signed off on that. A lot of the soundtrack is themes from other Zelda games remixed for the Game Boy Advance, but it's got plenty of its own music as well. I'm not sure if I have a favorite per se, but I really like the Cloud Tops theme, as it starts like the usual overworld theme that's been a classic since Zelda 1, but then it goes into its own grand adventure in the clouds type feel. I really need to try to become more of a music expert if I'm going to keep bringing this up in videos, but just listen to the track, you'll hear what I mean. Oh, and when it chills out for a second or two before getting all triumphant again...
Oh, that's just perfect. All right, kids, get your popcorn, because it's story time. Skip to this time code here if you wish to go into the story blind. Like most Zeldas, I think a lot of what makes the story good comes from its execution and the characters themselves in the actual story. But I'd still say it's worth going in blind, you know? Our story begins with an intro, telling us that a long time ago the world was on the verge of being swallowed by shadow. Until one day a group called the Pecori showed up, with a powerful blade and a golden light that gave a hero the power to fight back. After driving off the darkness, the blade was enshrined in a box. In the modern day, a festival is being held to celebrate the return of the Pecori, with our hero Link and his childhood best friend Zelda attending. The two have their fun at the festival, well, Zelda has fun at the festival where she eventually gifts Link a shield to help him better defend her. The two then run off to check out the sword fighting tournament, but only make it in time to witness the end, where the winner gets to touch the legendary Pecori Blade. The winner is revealed to be this kid named Vati, but before he touches the blade, he decides to blab his whole evil plan about world domination in front of everyone. This would usually be a bad move, but Vati is so powerful he throws everyone aside, including Link who tries to protect the princess with his shield, but he wasn't successful. Vati tries to throw Zelda, but her magical princess blood prevents this from happening, so Vati just freezes her in stone all Medusa style. Vati breaks the blade and opens the box that's said to hold great evil inside, however he's disappointed to see there was only a few monsters, instead of the force that he's looking for. Link wakes up later and is entrusted with the mission of reforging the Pecori Blade. Now usually this is where my snobby ass would go, THE CHILD DOING THE MISSION INSTEAD OF THE KING'S ROYAL GOD? PREPOSTEROUS! But the game has good justification as why Link is chosen. As they need the Pecori's help to reforge the blade and the Hylians believe that they only expose themselves to children. You know, in a fairy tale creature type of way, not the white van on the corner type of way. Of course, as we get into the story, it does seem that an adult probably could have done the job, but hey, I still appreciate the justification. Link heads into the Minish Woods to find the Pecori people, but he can't seem to find any. But before he leaves empty-handed, he hears a talking hat begging for help. Link saves the poor abomination whose name is Ezlo, and he reveals that he also has beef with Vati, so the two of them team up to stop the sorcerer with Ezlo revealing that he's able to transport Link to the world of the Minish by using portals hidden in plain sight as everyday objects. Link shrinks down and heads to the village of the Pecori, or as he learns from the Elder, the Minish, which is their true name. The Elder tells Link that if he wants to reforge the blade, he must travel all over Hyrule and find the four elements. Link does this and eventually reforges the broken blade into a new version of the White Sword from Zelda 1, that takes the color of the element imbued with it. Kinda wish we could choose which color the sword is, since we never use the purple one we see for a split second. I mean, we never get to use the wind's green version either, but the sword at base is already green. I know, I know, stupid nitpicks. Anyway, Ezlo and Link imbue the elements into the white sword at the Elemental Sanctuary, which is found between the world of the Minish and the world of Man. I was kind of confused at first about the whole two worlds thing, because the world of the Minish just kind of seemed to be, you know, our world, but it's clarified that the Minish we meet are mostly ones who left that old dimension behind to stay in ours, with this sanctuary acting as a sort of in-between. Once Link imbues the sword with the elements, he gains the ability to make a copy of himself, one for each element, which if my math is right means he should be able to make five copies? But they never really explain how it works, so I just imagine one of the elements is for base Link. Anyway, at some point in our venture, Vati comes to stop us with his magic. But as all good villains do, he leaves before he can make sure the job's done, allowing Link to beat the monsters and survive. After this, Ezlo explains his beef with Vati. You see, Ezlo was a Minish who developed a magic cap that grants wishes, which was stolen by his apprentice Vati after he was corrupted by the hearts of men. Vati uses the cap to become a powerful sorcerer, but he desired even more power, so he went off to find the Light Force which was a gift to humanity by the Minish so that he could use it as an unlimited source of magic. Couldn't he have just used the cap for that? I mean, it's a wish-making cap, but why not just wish for the magic or for the light force itself? Anyway, he transforms his master into a hat and then he ran off to the human world to find the light force, with Ezlo feeling remorseful for allowing all this to happen. After gaining the last element and imbuing it into the white sword, it transforms into the four sword 
unleashing its true power. With that same power actually acting as a key to open up a secret room in the sanctuary that tells the rest of the story we heard of in the beginning and how the Light Force was sealed inside the body of the princess at the time and is now passed down in her bloodline, with Link's friend Zelda being the one who currently holds it. Geez, Zelda, how come the gods let you have two golden lights? But then Vati pops in, revealing that he was listening the whole time, and he thanks our heroes for the history lesson as he now knows where to find his power. Link and Ezlo rush out of the sanctuary, only to find that Hyrule Castle has been transformed, and all the residents have been turned to stone. Link's able to free the people of their stony prisons with the Four Sword, but he learns that Vati has already ran off with the princess to the top of Hyrule Castle, and now Link must fight through it to reach them. Link makes it to the princess and he defeats Vati, but before they can make it to the elemental shrine and escape, Vati pops back up and closes the shrine, leading him and Link into a final battle. With the power of the Four Sword, Vati is finally defeated, with Ezlo now being able to return to his true form. The game ends with Zelda using the magic cap to return everything back to normal, and Ezlo thanks Link for everything before gifting him a familiar hat and then returning to the world of the Minish. The story in this game is pretty good. I've got a lot of little complaints and nitpicks, but like they're not too big a deal. The stories in Zelda range from decent to amazing, but I prefer the wacky characters in the gameplay. So if those make up for the story, I'm satisfied. And I think that Minish Cap accomplishes this. We've already talked about gameplay, so let's look at the characters. As usual, the world of Hyrule is full of a bunch of entertaining weirdos that really make the world feel alive. I've always appreciated this part of Zelda and it really does give it a fun identity. The main cast is as good as ever. Link is a silent protagonist, but they do give him plenty of goofy or entertaining moments that help him feel all his own. I bet they got the idea to really lean into this in some areas since the art style makes this Link look exactly like the dipshit from Wind Waker, who had some of the funniest moments in the franchise. Ah, <sighs> that never gets old. My favorite moment from this Link is when him and Ezlo are in the mines and Ezlo convinces Link to ride in a minecart. Link is unsure at first, but they both hop in and go light speed which freaks Ezlo out, but Link has this evil grin on his face. Ezlo's pretty cool. As a character, he's pretty much a nagging old man on Link's head, which lets him have some funny quips and reactions to things going on, as he's pretty much stuck to the head of a little gremlin that delves headlong into danger, but as a companion, I really wasn't feeling him all that much. Like, he has this habit of telling Link things that are pretty obvious, but I think that may just be a character trait of him being a worried old man. The same way your papa would tell you to put your boots on when you're cutting grass so you don't get snake bit. If that's what they were going for, I kinda dig it, but when I go out of my way to ask Ezlo for like a hint or something, he's just too vague most of the time. I don't mind his hints being vague cause sometimes you just want a hint instead of just being told to answer and Link's grandpa will give you a better one if you make the trip to see him but sometimes Ezlo just says something that's completely unhelpful. And I wish hints were a bit better in general since Minish Cap is the type of game where you backtrack a lot, and it can be hard to remember everything you come across. Zelda is a pretty small part of this game, but I love her and Link's friendship we get to see. It's really endearing seeing her be a goofy kid with Link running behind her to try and play hero. I love when she played the carnival game and got a choice of a few different cool items, but chose the tiny shield because she thinks it would be a good gift for her friend. I bet hearing this makes you think of Skyward Sword, and you know that's not a bad comparison. Both Minish Cap and Skyward Sword were written to be the beginning of the Zelda timeline. That's why the hero in the prologue didn't have a hat, as this game was supposed to be the origin of that part of Link's outfit. The same way Skyward Sword was the origin of the Master Sword. And Minish Cap has a whole lost civilization of people who fled to the sky, very similar to Skyloft and Skyward Sword. Both of these games have lots in common, another one of those being is how they feature an admirable friendship between Link and Zelda that leads our hero to want to save his friend. Of course Skyward Sword would steal a lot of Minish Cap's thunder in a lot of these aspects, but honestly, if I was going to make another origin story for the series, I'd steal a lot from Minish Cap too. Especially since Minish Cap didn't really feature these aspects as much, giving Skyward Sword the chance to build on them and flesh them out. I mean, Giraham probably took a lot from Vati, as they both represent a dark mirror of our hero in a few ways. Though Vati being his own master does give him an upper hand on Giraham, at least for now. 
Vati is an alright villain. I don't think he's the most interesting one in the series, but it is kind of cool that the handheld Zelda games were having all these villains who weren't Ganon. I like Ganon, but sometimes he's just kind of there, you know? I also feel kind of bad about fighting Vati, because he reads to be more of a spoiled brat with powers than a god sorcerer of the wind. His age is ambiguous, but like, I feel bad punting this toddler into the realm of darkness sealed inside my blade, you know? It's a little fucked up. But it is really funny to me that this game's reasoning for the heroes always wearing that little elf hat is because Vati wore one and he thought it would be hilarious to turn his master into one. That's just perfect, and it makes him look like another version of Dark Link, which is pretty cool. Though, it's a bit sad that this is the most we'll see of Vati. Even though he's an antagonist in the next two games, most of his development as a character is here, and from now on, he's just a villain with a win theme. I know this game came out after his next two appearances, so, you know, I understand, I just feel sorry for the guy. And that's The Legend of Zelda The Minish Cap. A tiny game that made a decent sized impact on the Zelda series with its fun gameplay, interesting visuals, and its drive to try and make a 2D Zelda that can stand toe to toe with a 3D Zelda. Nowadays that statement seems to be pretty funny because why would the extra dimension really be that big of a factor? But back in the day of handhelds and consoles being so separated, I can see why they'd make that a goal. Hell, a lot of the DS's selling point was that it was a Nintendo handheld able to do a 3D console experience. Minish Cap puts a lot of heart on its little sleeves, and I think that it's a legend worth diving into if you're ever curious. But this is only the beginning of the Four Swords Saga, and that saga will continue next time in The Legend of Zelda Four Swords. See you then. Oh, uh, I was going to mention this earlier, but I really couldn't find a good place to fit it in. The Minish were actually going to appear in Breath of the Wild, but they got cut. So hey, maybe they'll appear in Tears of the Kingdom? Maybe, maybe not. This is probably going to age the video. I just thought it'd be a cool tidbit to add in here. See you all in Four Swords.